Made possible by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. Welcome to the Carnegie Council. Today, our speaker is Philip Howard, and he will be discussing civility and the law. According to attorney and advocate Philip Howard, today's legal system does not give teachers and employers the authority they require to impose a code of ethics. We now present Philip Howard. I hope um, that you won't be too offended by, by, uh, by what I say about civility and law, and if you are, you will be civil in your disagreement. <laughs> uh, my interest is, has been for the last decade and a half in considering the relationship between authority and freedom. And what I've concluded is that the growth of law has corroded the, the, the institutions of, a, of authority in our society with many deleterious effects. And one of the victims of that is our sense of ethics and civility. Um, now what I mean by civility is, is a concept that actually goes back to the origins, which is the norms and manners required to live in a city, in a crowded place, which is, which is where the word comes from. We live in a crowded world now, which is increasingly interdependent, and we have to have norms that allow us to interact more freely. And it's not just the absence of rudeness, which is another way I think we commonly think of civility. I think the phrase also embodies adherence to ethical codes of behavior, to basic honesty in human dealings, and perhaps more importantly than anything else, respect for the common good. The higher the level of civility, the higher the level of trust in society in these, in these often anonymous dealings, and the higher the level of trust, studies repeatedly show the greater both our economic and our psychological well-being. Civility is how we define our culture. There was a wonderful scholar, judge, and cabinet minister in England about 100 years ago called Fletcher Moulton. He gave a, a great talk, which was then reprinted in The Atlantic, I think in 1924, uh, called The World of Manners. <clears throat> and he said there were three great domains of human action. One was the domain of positive law, where law tells us what to do and we have to abide by the law in a free society. The second was the domain of free choice, where we can do whatever we want to do, and no one will, will think otherwise. That's what living in a free society is. We have this open field of freedom where we can act according to our instincts. But then he said there's this great area in between called the world of manners. And it's this area in between, he argued, that defines a culture, and that ultimately, uh, the success of the culture ultimately depends on how we maintain this, this world of manners. And he put it this way, between can do and may do exists the whole realm which recognizes the sway of duty, fairness, sympathy, taste, and all the other things that make life beautiful and society possible. So it's all the norms of how we relate to each other in so many ways that ultimately define our success as a culture. And Lord Moulton concluded that this was the area of society that was most important, but also most unenforceable, because it depends on, on people's values. I agree with that partially, but I disagree with it profoundly in another way, which I will get to at the end. So if we looked at American society today, and you polled, polled Americans, and you ask, how are we doing from the standpoint of our civil norms and such, and there have been many recent polls addressing this, you will find that we're not doing very well. A Harris poll last month found that 87% of the public believes our political system imbues society with anger and ill temper and is counterproductive to the, to the health of our society. 87% in a poll is virtually, virtually unanimous. Other polls in the same time found the approval rating for Congress at 7%. That's also a sort of more or less matching, matching uh, 
numbers. Uh, we've all seen the attack ads in every election. It swayed the last election. They attacked the other side based on um, arguments that were half-truths and probably more untruths, and yet they were successful for the, for in several Republican races, and we don't approve of them, and yet we know it rubs off on the culture. Many moderate observers believe that the Gabby Gifford shooting in Tucson was a result of this ill-tempered, almost distemper of our political system that appears to be designed to polarize the public rather than to make legitimate arguments. And you'd have to say, when you look at the political debate, that there are almost no legitimate solutions in sight. There is um, one party essentially has its, as its main platform no new taxes, and the other party has as its platform we're not going to touch any entitlements. My uh, friend Will Marshall, who runs the Progressive Policy Institute, uh, commented recently that it's not true that bipartisanship is dead in Washington. There's a perfect bipartisan conspiracy to bankrupt the country. <laughs> if you look at corporate America, you'll see a same phenomenon of self-interested action where CEOs manage for short-term profits, not for long-term health, say with R&D, and seem to manage for very large oversized compensation packages, not, again, for necessarily conducive to restoring trust in the society. You go to schools. The culture of respect is non-existent in most urban public schools. We did a survey a few years ago, Public Agenda did a survey for us, where they found that 43% of the high school teachers in America say they spend more time maintaining order than they do teaching. And think about what that means. So that means the students are getting, those classes are getting at most half the learning they're, that they're supposed to get. Well, what happened to order? Well, that's actually been studied by Richard Aram at NYU, among others. Turns out there's a direct correlation between the rise of due process and the decline in order in, in America's schools. Uh, Public Agenda also did a survey about um, law in schools and found that 78% of the middle and high school teachers in America had been threatened with lawsuits or violations of the rights of their students by their students. Now, it's not that they would mostly sue, and if they sued, that they would win, but think of what it says about the corrosion of authority of teachers, that students feel with impunity and believing that they have legal rights to avoid the legitimate decisions of, of, of teachers, of teachers in, a, in a classroom. Go to the professions. The word profession comes from the idea of professing values. So a profession exists because it's supposed to stand for values of basic honesty and standards of conduct, whether it's in the legal profession or the medical profession, accounting profession, or others. Well, I will tell you as a practicing lawyer that I don't trust anything another lawyer says or writes. I've seen so many misquotes of cases, so many distortions of facts that the other lawyer knew were disingenuous, that this become commonplace to argue whatever you think you can get away with in a crowded, crowded courtroom. And then we go to the public, because the public is a big part of the problem here. We've trained everyone to see everything as a matter of individual rights. Parents, everyone. We think there's a problem, it's a matter of rights. And so you have this phenomenon where citizens think that the rights that our founders gave us to protect freedoms and pr create a society where we could actually work towards the common good now means grabbing at the common good like it's a dead carcass. Give me more. Pounding on the table. Ask any principal of a school about the kinds of behavior, the threats of lawsuits by by parents to get everything for their child irrespective of the effects on all the other students in the school. So what's the solution to this? How do we, we have this corrosion that the public generally feels of ethics in our society and civility? Well, the typical solution is to give a sermon to tell people to be nicer. My father was a preacher. He gave a lot of sermons telling people to be nicer. I never saw that it had much effect, but it was better than not, 
not giving the sermon, I suppose. Um, President Obama, in a State of the Union speech, very eloquent, called for a new era of responsibility where people would wake up in the morning and go forth and not just see things from their selfish point of view, but look at everything from the point of view of, of all of society. I think that's incredibly naive. That isn't how people are for the reasons stated by Reinhold Niebuhr, among others. People are organs of self-interest. They can justify anything as long as it's in their interest. People will do, or many people, what they can get away with doing. So if we want to restore civility and ethics, I submit, we have to have a social structure that allows us to judge people based on civility and ethics. Talking about responsibility, responsibility is peculiarly a concept that starts at the top, not at the bottom. Only if the teacher has authority to dismiss the disruptive child without paperwork, without proof, without due process hearings, can she maintain control of the courtroom. Otherwise, the students will learn, as they all have, that they can game the system with impunity because they feel her lack of authority, that she doesn't have the time to actually go through, fill out all those forms and go to those hearings. Only if the manager actually has authority to fire someone who's a jerk, who doesn't get along with people or doesn't try hard, will everyone else understand that the culture of this business is that people try hard and they pitch in and they help each other. They don't elbow pe people out of the way. When's the last time you saw a manager firing somebody for lack of civility or kind of ethical lapses? In America today, you're not even allowed to give a job reference. Speaking of not valuing ethics, that's the rule. My own firm has that rule. Because who will protect you if somebody sues and says it was, it was not, a, not, a good, not a good enough reference, or if you give a good one that the person wasn't any good? Either way. So the rule is everyone just says, well, I confirm that so-and-so worked here from this date to this date. That's the rule in America. Just like the rule in America is a teacher can't put an arm around a crying child. That's the rule. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a child was handcuffed, a seven-year-old in Queens, because he was disrupting the classroom. The rule is you're not allowed to restrain a student because you're scared they might get sued or accused of an inappropriate touching. So they called the police. And the police led the seven-year-old away in handcuffs. Is that good for the student? That's not uncommon. I could give you 20 stories like that. The, and if a bar association can't judge lawyers based on the perceptions of their committees, on the ethical values of those lawyers, what's the point? Today, it used to be when I was a young lawyer, to get into the New York City Bar Association, you actually had to have really legitimate letters of reference. You had to practice for a while. It would be going to a good school wasn't enough. You actually, people had to vouch for your character. Today, all you have to do is prove you have a law degree and you've never been indicted. It's just it's automatic, virtually automatic membership. There's no secret what happened here. We woke up to bad values in the 1960s and they were bad values. Racism, gender discrimination, pollution, ignoring disabled children. One after another, it's practically every month, there was a new revelation about what we might call abuses of authority in our society. And the solution that we came up with was that we were not going to allow people in responsibility to have authority to assert their values anymore. We were gonna lay it out as precisely as possible in law, and if you couldn't lay it out in law, we would have a legal process where everything would be proved by objective, objective proof. So that's where we got due process for ordinary school discipline, when you're not sending the kid to jail, you're sending him home. But we had this idea that we wanted a perfect fairness everywhere, but it didn't work. It didn't give us good values, it left a vacuum. And the vacuum has been filled by the selfish values who figure, by people who figure out how to game the system. Rights, which are our, the greatest principle for protection against abuses of government authority, 
have now become a tool of self-interest. So how do we get this back? I think we have to restore the authority to act on our values at every level of society. This is going to require a profound legal overhaul in general, replacing bureaucracy with broader principles and individual responsibility. We need, to, we need to sort of accept the fact that all choices to do anything in life are human. Rules don't make anything happen, only people do. People applying their values either in a good way or in a bad way, because there will be people who will assert bad values. And in my system, we can hold them accountable for those bad values. But you can't take values away without making everything fail. So it's interesting. Freedom actually has a formal structure we haven't talked about in a long time, really in our lifetime. But the formal structure is this. Law sets boundaries. It tells you what you can't do or you must do. You have to pay your taxes. You can't steal. But those same boundaries are supposed to affirmatively define and protect an open field of freedom. What uh, the philosopher Isaiah Blinn, frontiers not artificially drawn within which men shall be inviolable. And on that open field of freedom, people can do whatever they want. They can be jerks. They can have bad values. And Lord Moulton is right that we can't have law tell people what their values are. That's the antithesis of a free society. But this open field doesn't work unless law lets us judge other people by their values. They can be jerks, but we're free. They're free to be jerks, but we're free to judge them. And what modern law has done is taken away our freedom to make those value judgments. And it's also taken away the, the freedom of the people maintaining these boundaries. They can no longer actually assert norms of reasonable behavior, whether it's judges or principals or anyone else. That has to be restored. Public authority needs to be restored so that people with responsibility have the authority to do their jobs. You know, democracies, um, you know, it, it, it's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to purge our values. Democracy is about asserting values. We want to elect people and appoint people who are constantly asserting their values. And if we don't like them, we like someone else. Instead, we've disempowered up and down the line, everyone. In the private sector, the same thing. We've got to restore the freedom to judge other people. We do have to protect against discrimination, but discrimination is generally a systemic problem. It's not an individual person problem. So you can safeguard against patterns and practices of discrimination without taking away the ability of employers to write reference letters and to judge people by, by, by what they do all day. And then there's the political system. And there is a problem of powerlessness here, which I'm doing a lot with. We're just starting a, a new campaign called Start Over, startover.org, designed to sort of a basic overhaul of our regulatory system. Because what happens today is Andrew Cuomo goes to Albany to be governor. He finds that 75% of the budget is cast in legal concrete with deals and statutes made by people who are long dead. And he can't change one word of that or shave 5% off to balance the budget without getting a majority of the legislature to act. So there's this extraordinary powerlessness that's come from the accretion of law. And it's not that law is doing the wrong goals. It's just you need to do a spring cleaning every once in a while so you're meeting, so you're meeting today's goals. It is not so far-fetched to say that democracy today is run by dead people. It's all these laws that have piled up that don't allow anyone. The president can't approve a power line, take 10 years. You know, smart grid he promised in his campaign. He got to office, he was gonna stimulate the economy by, by spending billions on a new smart grid to create a green infrastructure for America. No way, it take 10 years just to go through the approval process. The interstate highway system, by contrast, was uh, authorized in an act in 1956. It was 29 pages long, and 14, pages, 14 years later, 35,000 miles of road had been built. Today, they would not have been finished with the Environmental Impact Review. So there is a problem of powerlessness having to do with the accretion 
of law. Our founders actually made a mistake. They didn't realize that it would be 100 times harder to repeal a law than to pass one. And so what's happened is the law keeps piling up and no one even talks about repealing the law. But that's because of us. Because each one of those laws has a special interest. And each of us is a special interest. And so if we're going to fall for the politics of let me keep my entitlements, lower my taxes, which are more or less the two choices we're given, then we're going to get a system that's fundamentally disingenuous and that's never going to solve the, the, the problems that we have. So somehow we have to abandon this politics of self-interest to create an organizational structure where we hold politicians accountable for legitimate proposed solutions to the many challenges of our day, not these pie in the sky sort of rhetoric, sort of hurling, hurling accusations back and forth. And that's the reason, in my view, it's so non-substantive, because they're just appealing to our emotions, not to anything real. But my concluding, I guess, what I wanted and tried to say in this is to get good values in a society, to get civility, we have to have the legal authority to assert them. We also have to have the backbone to assert them, which we don't seem to have in politics. But we don't have the legal authority. The teacher actually, it would be illegal for the teacher to do the things that she needs to do to, to run a classroom and to imbue her students with good values. So I believe we're at a period where we're going to have to fundamentally rethink the structure, the legal structure of our society, and that's the only way we're going to get back the America that we all believe in. Thank you. Um, civility and ethics and fairness um, in American society today in particular with specific reference to I, what I believe is the greatest disparity in wealth uh, in the country's history. Right. When I speak informally about it, I always feel like I'm sounding like a socialist. And I'm going to be condemned at that moment when I talk about income inequality right. and the notion of fairness in American society and how that's related to civility. So I was wondering what your thoughts might be on that. It's a pro I, I, <clears throat> I personally think that you're a communist. I, um, <laughs> uh, I think it's a significant problem. And it's a problem that's caused in part by the globalization of markets. There's just so much leverage. You know, one product becomes popular, and all of a sudden, whether it's Google or whatever it is, vroom, you know, it's off the charts, and whoever owns it or developed it now has a thousand times what they would have had a hundred years ago when you had more local markets. And so part of it, I think, is hard, is, is somewhat unavoidable. But I think that the people who are trying to avoid increases in taxes from 35 to 39 percent, for example, are shooting themselves in the foot because sooner or later the shoe will drop here and they'll get a wealth tax that's not unlike the taxes from the 1950s that were, you know, punitive rates and, and such. So I think it does, it is something that needs to be addressed. I don't think the phenomenon is largely the result of some sort of insidious behavior. I think it's largely the result of this, of the size of modern economic institutions and what happens when people get to the top of them. As we're rethinking the social contract and trying to restore people's freedom to take responsibility, we also have to rethink other, you know, other values and what we mean by fairness. Are there societies or cultures, past or current, where we can learn lessons. Uh, are the French, the Chinese, the Indians, do they have messages to teach us? It's a great question. Um, there, are, there are lessons to be learned from other cultures. Germany just passed a law basically uh, mandating a systemic review of old laws to clean out old laws so that new laws meet current needs. That's an example. There's a great book coming out by the Cambridge University Press that I wrote the foreword for comparing the United States system of civil justice with civil justice in Korea and Germany, and it takes one case and follows it through each system. 
You can't believe how stupid our system is compared to those <laughs> systems. Those systems are so much more fair. They're so much more available to real people. You can't hire, you can't go to court if you're a real person. In America, it's too expensive. So uh, absolutely, there are, there are a number of lessons. Now most cultures also have other problems. They have bureaucratic problems. They have the problems of big institutions and, and others. They have the problem of, of labor uh, with a version of short-term profits. Let's grab everything for ourselves, even if the state can't afford it, you know, pensions and the like. So Greece, France, all have that problem as well. But yes, there are absolutely lessons that others can learn. And this is a conversation I think that would be very productive to be had internationally because we're all in one market now and we all need to deal with each other and it would be nice to have the same basic norms of both civility, law, freedom, and others, and it would, I think that would enhance trust and enhance commerce and, uh, and enhance people's sense of ownership in their, you know, in, in, in their own cultures. Thank you again right. for all for coming. We hope this program was informative and provided some perspective on the underlying ethical issues. possible by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. For more information, see www.carnegiecouncil.org.